Hello, BookTube. Well, if there's blurry light this time around, it's not the camera, it's the air. <laughs> Since Boston is in the middle of a March blizzard. <sighs> and it was miserable. It's miserable outside. And I know this firsthand because I had mailing to do. I had a sack of books that were going out to various freelancers and to quite a few of you. And the sack had grown... I, the way I know when it's time to launch is when the sack is so heavy that I cannot carry it if it's any heavier. <laughs> so that's when I know I have to go out. And I had to bear that burden alone today because all the rest of you saw fit to let my people go and send my teenagers down south, including the one I own. He's not here. He's instead sunbathing topless on some beach in Mexico. So... I went out into the storm myself and did a bunch of mailing and did a few errands and then I came back to a mail hall and I thought we would do that together. It's a, it'll perk up my spirits and it seems like it perks up yours. Uh, and we'll start with one that barely made it to me. It's actually, the, the envelope is actually open. Uh, so <laughs> any more battering on, on this one's part and it wouldn't have reached me. <laughs> but it did, so what have we got here? Oh, fantastic. All right, so... Uh, we open with, this is a marked book, uh, and we open with a big fat history, which is good. Let's hope it's an omen. Uh, this is by Ben Kiernan, and it's his big new history of Vietnam. Uh, there was a soup to nuts bio uh, history of Vietnam last year. It was very good, but I'm always up for another one. That's fine by me. Uh, let me do this one here. This, this mail hall ends not only with a box, but with an immensely heavy box. So it'll either be a lot of books or it'll be something huge. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Uh, do you have a pub sheet? Want to tell me what this is? I'm, I'm blind without a pub sheet. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, anyway, this is by, the, by Yale, and it's called Blameless by Claudio Magris. Translated from the Italian by Anne Milano Appel. Is a diver launching into the unknown there. Claudio Magris is a professor emeritus of modern German literature at the University of Trieste. Uh, and he's won a ton of literary awards. He did a best selling novel called Danube that came out in English. I don't I don't think I remember that. I certainly didn't read it. So this is a novel then. Yeah, it's from one of Europe's most revered authors. Is that true? You Europeans out there, is this the Claudio uh, Magri, is he, is he venerated? Uh, his searing new novel ruthlessly confronts the human obsession with war and its savagery throughout the ages. His tale centers on a man who is maniacally devoted to the creation of a museum of war which involves both a horrible secret and a hope of redemption and peace. Okay. wonder what the cover is for. Well, it doesn't matter. The cover's nice anyway. Uh see here. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this so not to bother the babies? I'm like a pile of books here without bothering anybody. Alright, so on we go uh, to this next one. Yeah, it's another novel. Curiously similar cover. Uh, this is The End by Fernanda Torres. Translated by Alison uh, Entrecken. Entrecken? Fernanda Torres was born in Rio de Janeiro in 1965. She has enjoyed a successful career in theater, cinema, and television for 35 years. Hmm. So she's a famous actress. Uh, and this is her first novel. Okay, so she's decided to write a novel. Okay. Uh, the bracing debut novel for Mizan, Brazilian film star, tells the story of five aging male friends reflecting on their days of hedonism in Rio's Copacabana and hilariously grim realities of getting old. I like the sound of that. All right, so this is a debut by an actress. Comes out as a paperback original in July. Uh, great. Okay. I really kind of like that cover. <laughs> uh, you can see it in the snowy light. <laughs> uh, all right, so one big history and two works of fiction. Uh, let's move on here. Dying of curiosity to know what's in this gigantic box. I'm saving it for last, but I, I'm dying of curiosity to know. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, great! All right, this is comes out in late March. This is the finished copy of uh, G. A. Bradshaw's uh, Carnivore Minds. There's the thing with the finished copy. That is a sight you don't want to see up close. Take my word for it. Uh, this is 
uh, this is her study of s signature apex predators throughout the world. Shark, the great white shark, uh, rattlesnakes, grizzly bears, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and how complex they are. How complex their societies are and also how complex she uses the term without irony and she uses it very effectively how complex their emotional intelligence is uh i thought it was very refreshing i, I liked the book quite a bit i there were a couple of points i would tweak the author for especially her not infrequent mentions of these animals being the world's top killers and the world's top killing species without any seeming awareness that she's leaving out the worst killer in, hum in the, the history of the planet. <laughs> but, uh, but that's not what the book's about. So, uh, uh, oh my. Okay, this comes out uh, in late March, and it is uh, Carnivore Minds is really, really good, but this is a Steve book. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is. German colonial wars in the context of military violence. Can you see that? <laughs> Not that you want to. <laughs> this is by Suzanne Kuss, who uh, works at the University of Bern. Bern. And this is uh, the, the uh, colonial wars of the German Empire in the, on the eve of World War I. Believe it or not, <laughs> I know you've all gone to sleep by now, but believe it or not, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, to read about them. They are absolutely fascinating, not just for what they presage about what Germany would do militarily during World War I, but also what they presage about Germany just in general in World War II. I, they, they, if this is the book for them, I'm really going to enjoy it. I read a great one about 30 years ago on that same subject, but its title is escaping me, but I'll, I'll remember it. I'll have to if I'm going to read this. Uh, let's see here. Germany fought three major colonial wars from 1900 to 1908. The Boxer War in China, the Herero and Nama War in South in Southwest Africa, that had death camps and genocide, uh, and the Mahi Mahi War of East Africa. Recently, historians have emphasized the role of German military culture in shaping the horrific violence of these conflicts, tracing a line from German atrocities in the colonial sphere to those committed by the Nazis during World War II. Uh, this book dismantles such claims in a close examination of Germany's early 20th century colonial experience, despite acts of unquestionable brutality committed by the Kaiser's soldiers, she finds no direct path from Windhoek, the site of the infamous massacre of the Herero people, to Auschwitz. No direct path. Same military from the same, com from the same country committing the same kind of offense in the exact same kind of way with the exact same kind of justifying language? And there's no line? <laughs> in this book, she rejects the notion that a distinctive military culture or ethos determined how German forces acted overseas. Unlike rival powers France and Great Britain, Germany did not possess a professional colonial army. Well, oh, <laughs> neither did France or Great Britain in the sense of a professional colonial... <laughs> the forces it deployed in Africa and China were a motley mix of volunteers, sailors, mercenaries, and native recruits, all accorded different training and motivated by different factors. Germany's colonial troops embodied no esprit de corps that the Nazis could subsequently adopt. Okay. <laughs> all right. See, this is why I love history. This is why I love nonfiction. I know a lot about this subject. I obviously don't know as much as the author, but I know enough to have an opinion, and the author is going to have to every every line of that of that plot synopsis, which is probably overseen by the author, I disagree with, and I think I have good reason. So this author is going to have to fight me tooth and nail to make her case, and that, believe it or not, makes me the ideal reader for this book. I, <laughs> I can't wait. This is absolutely thrilling. That's why I love nonfiction, particularly history and biography, because one person will go at the same records that everybody else has seen with a different idea. They will read it and say, no, this doesn't mean what you think it means. This, uh, this doesn't mean what previous histories have thought it meant. And here's why I say that. <coughs> and it'll either be a compelling case or it won't. And it'll be endlessly fascinating either way. And the only thing that stands between most readers and understanding, getting as much fun out of this book as I'm going to get, aside from what I'm assuming, I'm assuming, I didn't see it, but I'm assuming that one of the things standing between them and this is an astronomical price tag. Uh, there's no... Oh, yeah, there is. There is a pub sheet. 
This thing is uh, almost 400 pages long, and it is $45. <laughs> uh, but the only thing, aside from that, <coughs> the price tag of half of $100, the only thing that stands between an, uh, an average reader and this, that the only thing that stops them from thinking of it as just as much fun as I think it's going to be, is a tiny bit of preparation. That's all. Just a tiny bit of preparation. The, the average reader would need to familiarize themselves with a broad outline of the German colonial experience, the, the, the place in the sun that the Kaiser wanted for his, for his nation, his share of, of the colonial experience that all the other nations in the world were having at the end of the 19th century. All, that's all that necessary. For instance, that book I mentioned, uh, the, uh, the History of the, world, of the Modern World by Palmer and Colton, has a wonderful chapter on colonialism. Or I'm sure that Wikipedia does. I'm sure that it has a vast chapter, probably with, with links to some works that are in the public domain. Or it, that's all it takes. Just that. You don't have to go to the library and find a book on colonialism. You just have to familiar, familiarize yourself with colonialism and British military or German military culture. Not hard to do. Wikipedia is probably sufficient for both. And then you too can dig into this book, where this author is upsetting. She means to upset a hundred years of received opinion. You know that it's my received opinion. I started it. It was the meaning I started talking when I saw the book. She says that's all wrong. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's see here. All right, end of sermon. <laughs> you already know that I, I would urge all of you to read more nonfiction. So, uh, oh my, oh, good, good, good. All right, this this is from Oxford University Press. It comes out in August when I presume the snow will be over. It's called Love, Madness, and Scandal, The Life of Francis Coke Villiers, the Viscount Purbeck. This is by Johanna Luffman. And it's got a blurb from Amanda Foreman, which is always good news. Uh, to her admirers, Francis, uh, okay, a little bit of a typo. Francis Coke Villiers, Viscount, Viscountess Purbeck, was a brave, witty, and beautiful, if tragic, heroine. To her detractors, she was stubborn, haughty, greedy, and indecent. In the high society of Stuart, England, Francis represented a scandalous and often ex exasperating noblewoman at a time when women were expected to submit to the authority of their family, their church, and their king. This is the story of an exceptional woman who refused to bow down to prevailing social conventions. <sighs> okay. All right. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. My only complaint, you can see it coming a mile away. Look at how small it is. I guarantee you there are more records than that. Uh, I. Maybe it's just really dense. Maybe it's densely packed. Maybe it doesn't need to be any longer than that. Uh, all right. On we go. Uh, some strong nonfiction here. That's good. Steve likes that. Well, oh, okay. All right. This is something we've seen on this channel before. I never know how much to stress that because I'm not sure how many new people there are. I am ever so slowly inching towards 3,000 subscribers, which is mind-boggling. Ever so slowly. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, I don't know what I'll do if we reach 3,000. I imagine I'll do some sort of event I don't know what I'll do if that happens. Uh, maybe instead of sending you all books, I'll just come visit. <laughs> uh, so this comes out in late March. This is the finished copy of, uh, I suppose I should talk about it, shouldn't I? This is Apollo in the Age of Aquarius by Neil Mayer. Uh, his book about the space program and the hippies. <laughs> hippies in space. <laughs> uh, and then we've got, uh, what have we got here? This is, okay, uh, this is due in June, I, I did not request it, but that's alright. Uh, it's called North Haven by Sarah Moriarty, and it shares the same problem that we've encountered on this channel before. It's by Amazon, it's by their little A imprint. Uh, at the peak of summer, when the sun is near its highest, time seems to stand still on the main coastline. But even in the absence of time, a familiar place of retreat is not immune to its own flawed history and uncertain future. In Sarah Moriarty's stunning debut novel, so it's a, she takes the reader on a journey to an island in Maine where the four Willoughby siblings have arrived to spend their first Fourth of July after the death of their parents. Hmm. Okay, and Sarah Moriarty got her MFA from the New School. Uh... 
and has worked for a bunch of magazines. Uh, she lives with her family in Brooklyn, and this is, this is as I mentioned, her her debut novel. Okay, I don't know what to do about these these Amazon imprints. I really don't. I have noticed uh, that they must have good people, at least one good person working for their these imprints, because the books are getting steadily better. <laughs> but this is this is a company that hates books and that hates authors so I, that aren't owned by them that hates other authors and that hates the book industry and wants to control it uh, it wants it to be amazon and it's hard to like the efforts of such a company even when it's not the author's fault the the, the only extent to which it's the the fault of somebody like sarah moriarty is that she grew impatient with the the normal with the rest of the publishing industry and decided to sign up with amazon knowing perfectly well all you have to do is read the new york times how how rapacious and predatory and unethical Amazon is so. Uh, I don't know. I, I I don't know. Some of you publish with Amazon, and I have thought about it myself. I've asked questions about it. I just <laughs> I don't know. I'm still up in the air about it. <laughs> uh, I'll still read the book though, definitely. Especially since, uh, by odd coincidence, I actually do know. I actually have firsthand experience of that timeless quality of the summer on the coast of Maine. I have I have spent ample amounts of summers on the coast of Maine. And it's uh, it's true. The sun climbs very slowly to its to its perch for noon and then just stays there. <laughs> it seems not to go anywhere. It just lasts forever. Huh. Oh, oh, great. Okay, this is, a, this is a novel that comes out in the summer, yes, in July, uh, called Fierce Kingdom by Jin Phillips. I want to read you this because the, the, if the, the plot summary doesn't do it for you, I don't know what will. Uh, the zoo is nearly empty as Joan and her four-year-old son soak up the last few moments of playtime. They are happy and the day has been close to perfect. But what Joan sees as she hustles her son toward the exit gate minutes before closing time sends her sprinting back into the zoo. Her child in her arms. And for the next three hours, the entire scope of the novel, she keeps on running. Suddenly, mother and son are as trapped as the animals. Joan's intimate knowledge of this place that filled her early childhood with happy diversions, the hidden pathways, the under-renovation exhibits, the best spots on the carousel and overstocked snack machines, is all that keeps them a step ahead of danger. A masterful thrill ride and an explosion, an explosion of motherhood itself, from its tender moments to, of grace to its savage power, Fierce Kingdom asks where the boundary is between our animal instinct to survive and our human duty to protect one another. From whom should a mother? For whom should a mother risk her life? Uh, and this is uh, Jen Phillips lives in Birmingham, Alabama. This is not her first book, but that's a killer premise. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. If maybe you have to be a, an old hack to see it. But this simple idea of being trapped in a zoo, fighting for your life in a zoo. That's just brilliant. It'll, it'll all, all much will depend on how it's executed, but I, I very much wanted to have the book. <laughs> and then we reach the payoff. This enormous... The box is is big, and it's also incredibly heavy. <laughs> so I don't know what could possibly be in here that would be so heavy. Uh, let's find out, shall we? What is in here? could be so big. Oh. This is the Atlas of Ancient Rome in two gigantic volumes. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. The first volume is text and images, and the second volume is uh, tables and indexes. Oh, this comes out in mid April. The product of decades of archaeological research and newly patented mapping software. This sumptuous two-volume slipcase atlas rebuilds ancient Rome from the ground up, showcasing the city as it has never been seen before. Oh, I did not request this. I know somebody at Princeton of great vote of thanks. Oh, my. All right. Okay, so we have uh, the Atlas of Ancient Rome in two volumes. Oh, my. <laughs> Uh, Apollo in the Age of Aquarius. I'm afraid nonfiction wins out in this, in this particular hall. Uh, German colonial wars in the context of military violence. A big new history of Vietnam. Carnivore mines. 
Um, Love, Madness, and Scandal. David Stewart, England. The End uh, by Fernanda Torres. Fierce Kingdom by Jim Phillips. Blameless by Claudio Magris. And North Haven by Sarah Moriarty. There you go. <laughs> Goodness gracious. That is what I call a Blizzard Day mail haul. <laughs> uh, now I'm, I'm going to go and explore all these. I'm especially going to open the Atlas of Ancient Rome. But first, <laughs> let's see if we can get herself to make an appearance. <laughs> There's the baby. Who's that baby girl? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go now, but I'll see you soon, book two. Thank you.